Hello everyone and welcome back to the program. Why can't all the churches agree on what is the kingdom of God? Is it the church? Is it something set up in the hearts of men? Is it the God within you? Is it the millennium? These ideas are commonly taught today in the world of traditional Christianity, but not one of them is right. Today, let's look into the Bible and see what God says about His kingdom. The Trumpet Daily. When Jesus Christ began His earthly ministry, He proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom of God. Yet few preachers even talk about the kingdom of God today. Why is that? You might hear a lot about a gospel of grace or a gospel of salvation. A lot of you hear a gospel about Christ. But why not the gospel of the kingdom of God? Why not the gospel that Jesus Christ preached? Notice that here in Mark chapter 1, the book of Mark. And as I've told you many times before, make sure that you read along with me. If you have a Bible nearby, hopefully you have a King James Version of the Bible. That's what we recommend. But grab a Bible and read along with me. After all, we're talking about the gospel message that Jesus Christ himself preached. That's an important subject that you need to look into for yourself. As I said, you don't hear much about this gospel today. You don't hear about the kingdom of God today because the churches have lost all knowledge of what it actually is. But you can find that knowledge in the pages of your own Bible. That's why you've got to read up on this for yourself. You've got to prove it for yourself and see what God actually says in the Bible about the kingdom of God. Mark chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So here is the beginning of the gospel that Jesus preached. And what is that gospel? Well, read down in verse 14. It says, Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. That's what he came into the, the, the Galilee area to preach. The true gospel message of the soon coming kingdom of God. Now, so many people today misunderstand the truth of the gospel because Jesus didn't set up that kingdom at his first coming. Even the disciples were confused on this subject. They were expecting Jesus to set up the kingdom of God then. And he had to set them straight on this in the parable of the pounds, saying that he would go into a far country or into heaven to receive the kingdom and then to return and to set up that kingdom on this earth. That's what Jesus told them. That's what he taught his disciples. I've covered before, just a few months ago, a number of other verses that talk about Jesus being born to be king. He was born to rule. He told Pilate, yet this, this kingdom, my coming rule, is not of this world. It's not of this time period. It's not of this age. But it is coming, be assured. That it is coming. Now the plain truth, the plain teaching of the Bible is that after this present evil world, as Paul called it, the Apostle Paul, after this present evil world collapses under the weight of rampant sin and ignorance, then Jesus Christ will return and establish the kingdom of God on this earth. It's to be headquartered in Jerusalem. That's the truth of the Bible. Now the kingdom of God is the, the government of God administered by the family of God. That's what the kingdom is. God's family administering His government. Now you look at kingdoms in this world and all of them are ruled by a, a leader or a king or a ruler who's there administering a government. He has an administration. He's ruling over subjects. He has a definite territory in which he rules. When Christ returns as supreme ruler, it says in Revelation 11, we'll get to that uh, later if we have time, but it says that the kingdoms of this world 
will become the kingdom of God. In other words, God's kingdom will rule over the nations or kingdoms of this world. Those kingdoms will then cease to exist as God's government will rule the world. That's what it says in Revelation 11. And yet, look at the many different gospel, so-called gospel messages that you see in the world today. Most of them talk about, really, a weak Jesus who died of a broken heart. And again, there's so much misunderstanding on this subject because Jesus Christ didn't immediately assume control of his kingdom when he came the first time. But, as I said, he told Pilate himself, look, my kingdom's not of this world. He came the first time to deliver a message. He came the first time, as we just read in Mark 1, to preach the the good news message of the soon coming kingdom of God. Now, he did other things too. He had to lay down his life in sacrifice. He had to die for you and for me. And before then, he, of course, trained disciples and prepared them for the establishment of the true church. And then he was crucified. And then he ascended to heaven. And he's there to this day. But as so many prophecies in the Bible bring out, he will return. That's the truth of the gospel. Let's look over here at Daniel chapter 2, and we'll come back to this subject of uh, a kingdom. Just what is a kingdom? As I say, when you look into this world, you see that it's, it's quite obvious what a kingdom is. A king uh, with an administration, ruling over subjects in a definite territory, administering laws. That's not that complicated to understand. Why is it then, when we talk about God's kingdom, that we think of it in different terms, or we have these different ideas. Now, Daniel wrote his book between 605 and 562 uh, BC. Israel had already gone into captivity many years before, and then Judah, just before Daniel. Well, Daniel actually was part of that captivity, taken away captive into Babylon, this first world-ruling kingdom And in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, little Daniel, this teenage boy, he's in Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar has this disturbing dream and it troubled him so. He called the magicians and the sorcerers of the kingdom to come in and to interpret this dream. And none of them could do it. And so Daniel was brought in, this little Jewish teenager. He was called before the king. Daniel had been given this great wisdom. He had been given this special talent by God for understanding visions and dreams. It says in Daniel 1, you can study that later on your own, but this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, it's it's recorded here in Daniel chapter 2. This great image with a, a head of gold and then the breast and arms that were made of silver and its belly and thighs were made of brass and then the legs were iron and its feet were part iron and part clay. All of this is described in Daniel chapter 2. But let's read here in verse 28. It says, But there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Daniel was brought before this king, and he didn't take credit for this special understanding he had of visions and dreams. He said it was God. It was God who made these things known. God is the revelator. God revealed it. This great image, he went on to explain, represented four world-ruling kingdoms. He says there about Nebuchadnezzar, you're the, the head of gold. Your kingdom. Your rule. This, this Babylonian empire, the Chaldean empire, that's the head of gold. But then after you would come these others. In verse 39, you can see it was to be followed by another kingdom inferior to you and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. That's what verse 39 says. So he's describing all of these worldly kingdoms. Again, with a king and and an administration and laws, a government, subjects, territory. That's what's described all through 
this chapter, these world ruling kingdoms with leaders and, and, and people being ruled over. The Chaldean Empire, of course, and then the Persian Empire, if you look at the secular sources to understand what Daniel was getting at here. And then the Greco-Macedonian Empire, and then finally the, the fourth kingdom, the Roman Empire, the two legs of iron, the greatest worldly kingdom of all, ruling from between 30 BC to 476 AD, five centuries, this great and mighty Roman Empire, but yet after it was crushed in 476, there's other prophecies in the Bible that talk about seven resurrections to come out of the heart of Europe. We've talked about that often on this program. That's a, a slightly different subject. But if you look into Daniel 7 and Revelation 13 and Revelation 17, you begin to get all the details about these world ruling empires, these kingdoms. But just to bring it back to our subject here today, God's kingdom, the kingdom of God, drop down to verse 44 and see what it says here. And in the days of these kings, these kings, this is specifically referring to that seventh and final resurrection of the Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, the ten kings, as is mentioned in Revelation 17, or the ten toes right here in this, in this vision, this chapter, Daniel 2. He says, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. You see, finally, after 6,000 years of a world that's, that's just continually gotten worse in terms of violence and misery, God will set up and establish His kingdom on this earth. And as it says there, it will consume all of these kingdoms. In this particular vision or dream, uh, God's kingdom is represented by the stone that strikes the image at its feet, brings that image crumbling down. And then the, the stone, of course, expands into this massive kingdom that spreads over all the earth. Now, as I say, to go back to the, that very basic point, all of these kingdoms discussed in Daniel chapter 2, all of them, they're talking about kingdoms where there were rulers or kings ruling over people, uh, a literal government over subjects in a definite territory, and then along comes God's kingdom, and it breaks in pieces. It literally smashes the kingdoms of this world and then fills this earth. God's kingdom fills this earth. God's kingdom will be a world ruling government. God's kingdom is his family administering his laws. It's his family government. So much of this is discussed at length in Mystery of the Ages. Last year we, we made a real push to get this book out to as many people as possible. We sent this to more than 2,000 people in, uh, in 2015, and this is the first time we're offering it again this year. And we urge you, if you haven't gotten a copy already, we urge you to get your own copy of Mystery of the Ages and to read about the soon coming kingdom of God. Chapter 7 in this book is the mystery of the kingdom. We did a program on that very subject just a couple of months ago. The mystery of God's kingdom. It's a mystery, a great mystery in this world today. People just don't know. They've lost this knowledge. They're so far removed from God's truth that they don't know the truth about the kingdom of God. They don't know the truth about the gospel message Jesus preached. So make sure during the break that you write down the information you need to call us or text us or to order this copy of Mystery of the Ages uh, online. We don't, we don't ask for anything in return. Well, we do ask that you study it, <laughs> but we don't ask for money. We don't ask for you to pay for this. It's already been paid for. So make sure that you make your request today so that we can send this wonderful book out to you right away. We'll be right back.
Jesus Christ came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Yet few preach about the kingdom of God today, for they have lost all knowledge of what it is. A prominent evangelist once said that the gospel of the kingdom of God is not for us today. Some denominations proclaim a gospel of grace, some what they call a gospel of salvation, most a gospel about Christ, some a social gospel. Some churches claim either that their particular denomination or Christianity as a whole constitutes the kingdom of God. But what does the Bible say? The truth about the kingdom of God is indeed a great mystery to this world. It's also the most glorious good news to those whose minds have been opened to the truth of the Bible. To remove the mystery from your Bible and to understand the truth about the soon coming kingdom of God, request Herbert W. Armstrong's masterful work, Mystery of the Ages. We offer it freely to those who are genuinely interested in understanding the Bible. You don't have to live in the fog of the unknown. You don't have to wonder why you were born or where this world is headed. The great mysteries of life can be made known to you if you choose to know. The choice is yours. Request Herbert W. Armstrong's masterful work, Mystery of the Ages. We don't have a lot of time left, but let's just go through a few more verses. These are verses that will really make you think. Read along with me in your own Bible and see what God has to say about the kingdom of God. See what Jesus has to say about the kingdom of God. We'll continue our study in John, the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 3. This is a, an exchange here that Jesus Christ had with Nicodemus, this scholarly Jew who knew because of the miracles, because of the message that Jesus preached, he knew that Jesus was sent from God. He knew that he was a preacher who came from God. Look at verse 5 in John 3. It says, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born of water and of spirit, of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And so the kingdom of God is something that you can enter into but not until you're actually born of the water and of the Spirit. Now back up to verse 3, and notice what it says. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so the kingdom is something that you can see, but you have to be born again. You have to be born again. You have to go through a spiritual birth. And Christ explains that right here in this same passage. Now down to verse 6. He says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do you get the meaning? You understand it in the fleshly sense. When you see a little baby born, that which is of the flesh or born of the flesh is flesh. And when you're born of the Spirit, you will be spirit. God himself is a great invisible spirit being. We worship him in spirit, it says in John 4. And when you're actually born again, you will be spirit. That's the truth of the Bible. Let's go over here to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, and we'll look at verse 50. But just think about what that passage in John 3 is pointing out. There's a lot of... Uh, they're very sincere, but a lot of people today that are very deceived on the subject of born again, thinking it's just some kind of emotional experience, when in fact, it's a spiritual birth into the family of God. Again, this is an easy concept to understand when you look at it in the flesh, when you look at the physical. But why is it that so many people just veer way off when it comes to the spiritual things of God? Well, it's because so many of these are great mysteries and that the world has been blinded to, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 
This is 1 Corinthians 15 and uh, verse 50. It says, Now this I say, brethren, uh, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Flesh and blood, a physical flesh and blood being, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now study this passage together with John 3. Put it together and see what God is revealing about the kingdom of God, about the subject of born again. God is, I mean, these are profound truths. If you're flesh and blood, you haven't seen the kingdom of God yet. And that means everyone who's watching this program, myself included, the kingdom of God hasn't been set up yet on this earth. But look at verse 52. It says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. We shall be changed to spirit, in other words. And the dead in Christ will rise to meet Jesus Christ in the air before then returning to this earth. As is brought out in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Revelation 11. Oh, but there's so many passages that talk about the establishment of that kingdom on this earth. Let's go now over to Colossians uh, chapter 1. The book of Colossians chapter 1. Few people realize these, these precious truths that I'm describing to you here today. So many people on this earth are under the impression they've been born again. The only one who's been born again is Jesus Christ. He was born of the flesh. His mother was Mary. But then he experienced a great spiritual birth. And he's now sitting at the right hand of God. Now that's brought out in the many scriptures. The John 1 study later, you can see that he, I mean, he was a great spirit being, the Word, as it says there at the start of John 1. But then he was made flesh. He came in the flesh. And he lived a life, a very short life in the flesh, overcoming and conquering his adversary, sacrificing his life for the world, teaching disciples during his earthly ministry to prepare them for the establishment of the church of God. And then after his crucifixion, what happened? Well, he was dead and buried for three days and three nights. And then God resurrected him to life. Spirit life. This is Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. It says, And he, that's speaking of Christ, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Notice that. How is he born again? He was born from the dead when God raised him to life. And he was the firstborn. He, he, he's first, before Abraham, before David, before Moses, before any of them in the Old Testament. They're dead and buried, but they're going to be resurrected, as we just read in 1 Corinthians 15. Christ, though, when he was dead and buried, he was brought back to life. God resurrected him from the dead, and Jesus lives today. He didn't die of a broken heart and then was left hanging on a stake. He did die. He was crucified. But he lives. He's the firstborn among many. Let's just finish over here in Romans chapter 1. Romans 8, of course, talks about him being the firstborn of many brethren. So there's others to come along. He's first, and then there's others. Those in the church first, and then eventually all of mankind. Once that kingdom, once that government is established on this earth, and everyone on earth will have a chance to learn and to appreciate these precious doctrines, these truths of God. Then the family of God will open up and expand to everyone. Verse 3 of Romans 1, concerning His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. So He was a flesh and blood human being of the seed of David, born of the Virgin Mary, but then verse 4, it says, And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. That's how He was made a Son of God, by a resurrection from the dead. 
Now, if you spin back over here, we don't have time to turn there, but look on the board. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. It goes on and says, for as much as you saw that stone, that stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands, and it broke in pieces the image, and then the stone expanded and grew. That's what Daniel 2 says. Let me just finish with a quote. This is from Herbert Armstrong. He said, Jesus of Nazareth was the world's greatest newscaster. Many deceiving and being deceived have misrepresented his teaching as a sentimental religious teaching, having no relation whatever to this life, this world, its nations, its governments, its society. He says that concept is false. Jesus' gospel was actually his advanced news report of the kingdom, the government of God, soon now to bring us world peace. He says the kingdom of God is simply the world-ruling government of God. It is absolutely not a sentimental, ethereal, imaginary something set up in the hearts of men. It's something real, he says. It is soon coming. That's what the kingdom of God is. Make sure that you request mystery of the ages so that you can continue your study and understand the mystery of the kingdom of God. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next time. The Trumpet Daily Radio Show records from Trumpet Daily Facilities at Edstone in the United Kingdom, and it's available online at thetrumpet.com. You can also download each episode as a podcast through iTunes, SoundCloud, or thetrumpet.com. Every weekday afternoon on the Trumpet Daily Radio Show, Stephen Flurry analyzes the really important news. The news behind the news. The news that means something in relationship to the march of biblical prophecy. It's news you probably won't read in your favorite newspaper or website. Just log on to the live stream at thetrumpet.com.